um, we're not going to move on uh, to introduce uh, Al Scott. Um, Al is going to talk about using a physics education to communicate science to society. Um, so I'll just mention that I know Al. <laughs> we actually work in the in the same group, but he um, he has another job besides the communicating science to society. Uh, but he's going to talk about this part of it of his uh, use of physics. Okay, ahead, can you see my slides? Yes. Excellent. So thank you for the introduction and the invitation, Ian. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm an engineering fellow in optical technologies at uh, the Honeywell uh, Small Satellite Greenhouse uh, and an adjunct professor at York University Center for Research in Earth and Space Technologies. Uh, I'm a fellow of the Engineering Institute of Canada and the Institute of Physics. Uh, received my PhD in astrophysics from University of Waterloo in 1997. And before that, I got a Bachelor's of Science in Physics from University of Guelph. So this talk focuses on something a little bit less hard science than our previous uh, talks. Uh, so you can maybe relax your, your, your uh, calculations and, and your hard thinking and think more in, in the soft communications of a science, the soft fields, as it were. And I want to focus a little bit on the responsibility of scientists to counter pseudoscientific ideas in society and review some of the factors that have led, in my opinion, to a rise in popular anti-science sentiment in society. I want to provide some insights into how to communicate the ideas of science with the public. And I'm going to give some examples of important environmental issues that are most commonly misconstrued by the general public uh, from my pro-science, eco-modernist perspective. So uh, who am I? You've probably all recognized this, uh, this show. I was actually an unholy hybrid of Raj and Leonard in my graduate work doing laboratory astrophysics. Um, so I wasn't actually going around to telescopes and looking at things. I was in the lab uh, looking at uh, simulated interstellar dust analogs and blowing them up with lasers. So lots of fun. And then I went on to become Howard Wolowitz, unfortunately, uh, building hardware for space. But if you're familiar with uh, comic books and recognize Sheldon's shirt and the logo there, you might know that as Alan Scott, I'm actually the original alter ego of Green Lantern. So, what do I do for a living? After graduation, I joined the space group at Cal Corporation in Ottawa, uh, developing space-based remote sensing payloads for science instruments. I wanted to stay connected to astronomy and physics, so I joined the Ottawa Royal Astronomical Society of Canada chapter, uh, and I went through as a council member, and eventually I served a term as president. I also ran the telescope loan library for about a decade, where we loan out uh, telescopes to members uh, for a very minimal fee. So the Cal uh, Space Group went on to be purchased by EMS Technologies uh, and then ComDev in, I think, 2005. And now we're owned by Honeywell. So we, we, we change our, our letterhead every five or 10 years. Uh, and as, as Denise says, in, in industry, you get to work with such a broad scope of things. You get, to, you get this broad scope of... Um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're worried about the, the narrowness of doing a physics PhD, which, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a breath of fresh air to be able to investigate so many things and learn about so much stuff. And, and, and also, I was very lucky to get into a field where I can do cool space stuff. Um, so I've worked with atmospheric remote sensing with uh, York University, uh, compact magnetic resonance imagers with University of Winnipeg and Mars mineral spectros spectroscopy. Uh, I've worked with... Uh, Doppler imaging of atmospheric winds with the University of New Brunswick. I've worked with the University of Victoria on Oort cloud asteroid occultation instrument concepts. I've worked with the University of Guelph developing lunar greenhouses to grow plants on the moon. Uh, I've worked with Carleton and York on nanophotonics and integrated optics for optical communication systems and spectroscopy. Uh, I've worked on lunar instrumentation with Western I've radiation tested electronics at the high energy proton beams at Triumph in Vancouver. I'm currently the technical lead on the Castor Space Telescope. Um, 
here you can see in this picture of some of the cool space stuff. This is um, uh, a biological instrument on the International Space Station that I worked on developing a fluorescence imager for a microfluidic uh, chip so the astronauts can use just a prick of blood instead of taking a whole vial of blood and sending it down and get uh, in situ uh, assessment of the, the blood chemistry. This is the, the sapphire optical payload on Canada's uh, operational defense satellite, looking at other satellites and plotting their courses and sending that data to NORAD to prevent satellite collisions. This is the James Webb Space Telescope fine guidance sensor with, that I worked on for radiation assessment and radiation tolerance ass assessment of detectors and things like that. And I'm working on a lot of different future missions. I'm working with Ian on uh, KeySat, which is a quantum key distribution uh, prototype that we're building for the Canadian Space Agency. Castor, as I've mentioned, is a, a Canadian-led one-meter class optical and ultraviolet uh, satellite mission, uh, which is, is being worked on by University of Victoria, led by Pat Cote at uh, Hertzberg Institute. Uh, optical inter-satellite communications links, as you see here, is, is what I'm, what's paying the bills, uh, working with Honeywell and developing terminals to, uh, to help uh, support internet in the sky. This is uh, some of the optical, uh, the integrated optics stuff that I'm doing with uh, uh, the NRC here in Ottawa and uh, Western and University of Toronto and York and Carleton. Uh, looking at developing optical phased arrays for satellite laser beam pointing uh, using no mechanisms. And that's a really cool project, lots of fun. Throughout all of this, I've supported the scientific method online and through my social media commentary. Um, I know probably all of you are, have social media accounts and, and you see the pseudoscience out there. It's been a, that part of it's been a bit of a frustrating experience for me as society seems to be slipping backwards from, from my youth when, you know, we had the space program and there was, you know, we're going to the moon. We have all of these different uh, rockets and it looked like we were on this progression to, to everyone having their own jet packs. And then things kind of fell apart or so it seemed. And, and society started having a bit of a mistrust. And, I felt as though that there, the message is important. I had a responsibility to communicate science. Uh, I felt that science, I feel that scientists as a whole have not been winning the war of trust in the public's eye. We're seen as elites in, in ivory towers and, and disassociated from the rest of society. And I think this has hurt the profession and it's hurt society. This, and it's partly, it's, it's partly the fault of scientists for disengaging and not paying attention to the public messages that they put out and not working hard to communicate uh, their work to the public. We've allowed the world to take some giant steps backwards. We didn't speak up strongly enough to defend the safety record of nuclear power. I remember when the disar disarmament protests were going on for nuclear weapons testing, and, and that's definitely a laudable goal. And it was great that we stopped airborne nuclear weapons testing, but we threw out the baby with the bathwater when we stopped developing nuclear power. And it seemed difficult to defend nuclear power when we collectively needed to focus on nuclear disarmament. And now, thanks to our silence, we have a climate catastrophe, catastrophe to fix. Our, our scientific communication strategies in general need work. Why is society disengaging from us? Are we inclusive? Are there vast swaths of society that see us as elitist? Here are some issues you probably recognize, the, the echo chambers in social media that support all of the, these anti-vax and no to GMO and creationist and homeopathy and flat earth. And all of these things seem to have found, um, found their footing in these little protected echo chambers on the internet and in, in social media, where the social media uh, gives them clickbait headlines and gives them what they like and doesn't force people to communicate uh, outside of your echo chamber. You, every group in the world can find their, their home without having to challenge their beliefs. And I think that is one of the biggest problems. So are we being inclusive and why aren't people talking to us? Why aren't people listening to science? Have to mention 
that we as a group of physicists are not gender representative of society. There's a cult of genius, I think, in a lot of cases that people buy into that says that brilliance is innate in people's genes. And a lot of people will say that women can't physically think like men. However, I think the data, if you look into it on success in technical and STEM fields shows that career in a scientific uh, job correlates more with grit and tenacity than with IQ scores or genetics. Adherence to traditional gender roles results in female scientists who want families being sidelined during the productive period of their life that most men are doing postdocs for peanuts uh, and building scientific reputations. And there's a problem there. What proportion of you consider child rearing to be a woman's role? Even, even visionary uh, science fiction of the future. You look at the Star Trek series, and I was looking back at going over the original Star Trek series because I'm a big fan of Star Trek. They even fall prey to this. And in the episode, Who Mourns for Adonis? Kirk and McCoy are talking about a beautiful female officer saying that one day she will find the right man and Kirk will lose an officer. This is, this is a mindset that's still in society and is pervasive. And there's a stigma against men taking time off to raise children. We as a society, I think, need to downplay traditional gender roles and realize that some people will want a family. And we need to, we need to build career paths for physicists that can support raising families. We need to identify that the current path of postdocs for peanuts does not support that and turns off a whole portion of potential physicists from getting into academia. So those are the problems. What can we do to get our message through? Scientists are taught uh, to communicate by presenting factual arguments alongside all the appropriate caveats for the scientific literature to appear unbiased. And this is fine for the scientific literature and expected and, and respected. It's not effective in communicating to the general public. Leaders of pseudoscientist movements are extremely confident and also charismatic. This is what they do for a living. Uh, and if you're aware of the Dunning-Kruger effect, this is probably why most of them have a lot of confidence. Scientists, however, when we communicate with the public tend to show how we might be wrong. And we sound tentative and uncertain if we're communicating with the public. One of the favorite debating tactics that I run into uh, on these uh, pseudoscience uh, groups is called, is nicknamed the Gish Gallop after Dwayne Gish, who was a famous uh, creationist. Uh, and basically, they would basically shotgun out a whole bunch of bogus arguments trying to poke holes in, in science or, or in, you know, so doubt. And a lot of it is based on misunderstandings, whether uh, whether real or not, about real science. And if you're in a debate with these people and you start scrambling to research all of these points and provide long factual rebuttals of each one, you're going to lose a debate. Because the message gets lost. This is a bit of a sound bitey medium. It's better in that sort of a case when you're facing a gish gallop is to you know, give a blanket statement of BS and ask them to identify their best argument and then dismantle it decisively with facts. Keep your cool, don't take the bait to become riled as this is gonna alienate the silent majority who are on the fence. Now, many important social issues have become polarized and, and, and the debate quickly usually degrades into a yelling match between isolated extremes who can't even agree on basic facts. Social media encourages these echo chambers and in these echo chambers, they create their own reality to match their pre-existing biases and the opponents become idiotic caricatures. Psychologists will tell you that when you have someone with an opposing viewpoint, uh, which is held strongly emotionally for some reason, quoting facts and statistics are not effective at changing people's minds. And this is our typical approach. We, we, we say, here's the facts, here's the statistics, and, and people don't care. That makes them, uh, oh, these, 
that makes them basically shell up as, you know, turtle up. These are the elites. You can't trust them. What you need to do is find common ground. You can't attack people to get them to listen to you. You need to look for common ground and work outwards from there. These people aren't necessarily idiots. The general public, you know, half the general public aren't idiots. These people don't have the education or the background to investigate scientific literature themselves. So they trust their, their leaders. It's a form of tribalism. Name calling, flaming and weaponizing, meme posting just increase the polarization. So this isn't just the pseudoscience side of the issue. A lot of pro-science people are in the same camp of tribalism. They've just picked science to be their tribe and they don't really understand the bases of the arguments that they're using. If you were challenged on a debate, for example, could you provide a coherent scientific argument on the spot supporting the age of the universe? Could you bring evidence? Maybe. What about the safety of genetically modified organisms? No, you can't on the spot bring that up unless of course you're you know, very bright and in that field. It's just impossible to know enough to have the facts at your fingertips on all of these things. And with a physics background, we have the ability to research these things quickly, to look over the, the literature, um, summarize, look, look for summaries. We understand how to search the literature, how to read papers, how to bring the facts to the arguments. And I said, I would give you some, some examples. Um, how about the health risks of nuclear power? Could you put together an argument? Uh, as physicists, we should understand the basics of a nuclear reactor, how they work. But most people don't know that the UN Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, or UNSCEAR, has reviewed the Chernobyl accident and concluded that, concluded that ba basically from the, the radiation that was released, less than 100 deaths can be attributed to that radiation. That shocks a lot of people. Right now, the, the radiation in, in the Chernobyl exclusion zone is down to three or four microsieverts per day in most places. It's not much different from background levels anywhere else in the world. How much is dangerous though? No measurable increase in cancer is, is, has been shown in humans without, without having more than, or with, a, with less than 100 millisieverts of acute dose, which is from the, the Hiroshima cohort study, Anyone, anyone who got less than 100 millisieverts in that one acute dose, there's no measured increase in cancer risk. So that's 100 millisieverts acute dose. Walking around Chernobyl, you're three to four microsieverts per day. There's really no evidence for uh, increased cancer from, uh, from to uh, chronic dose, from low dose areas. You can get, you know, tens of millisieverts over a year and there are no n correlatable increases of cancer. Now it's difficult to, to track uh, correlations for cancer because it's so common uh, and small changes due to background radiation are very difficult to tease out from all of the other sources of, car of cancer from diet, uh, sunlight and oxygen, for example, um, very difficult to tease out. There's a big uh, debate going on right now over whether we should use a linear no threshold theorem for, for the health effects, which leads to the ALERA principle being applied to nuclear reactors that as little as reasonably allowable radiation drives the cost of nuclear to be almost unattainable. Uh, yet there's no, radi there's no medical evidence supporting that principle. There's actually a, si a similar amount of evidence showing radiation hormesis, that small amounts of radiation are actually good for you and, and induce uh, repair mechanisms in your body. So the, I wouldn't say that's accepted scientific fact, but it's on the same level as, as the other option. And one of them basically causes climate change if you accept it. So when challenged by someone who spends their life on this stuff and you get out of your depth, the tendency is for any semblance of polite discussion to break down into ad hominem. But how are we going to avoid another Fukushima unless scientists speak out and challenge popular myths that support existing biases. 
Uh, if you're aware of the Fukushima Daiichi reactor meltdown after the 2011 earthquake and tsunami, it was a horrible disaster. Thousands of people were killed in the tsunami and evacuated from their homes. Elderly and the sick were evacuated from their homes due to the meltdown. And many died when they couldn't receive the care they needed due to the lack of infrastructure from the tsunami. And they weren't allowed to go back to their homes for several years. In fact, some of them, several areas still are evacuated. And we know that now, had they stayed put, the radiation levels most likely wouldn't have caused any significant health effects. But 1,600 people died in the evacuation from the fear, from being displaced from their homes and their support networks when they should have stayed. In fact, as a result of Fukushima, Germany made the decision to shut down their nuclear fleet. Japan immediately shut down all of their nuclear fleet. And we know how many deaths resulted from the uptick in fossil fuel burning because of the shutdown of nuclear. And you can see here that it's a very clear signal that thousands of people are dying because we're allowing fossil fuels instead of nuclear. So the pandemic gave me time to reassess my priorities. Uh, and as a result, I decided to start uh, speaking out more on these topics and providing an evidence-based perspective to the public. And the way I did that was I started a podcast. And what I wanted to do was to be able to use the tools of science to address important social issues that I thought were, were being, uh, where there was a lot of misinformation. I read the key papers and then what I did was I put out um, podcast episodes on a lot of different ideas, on a lot of different things that, that people uh, are worried about and have that are, you know, pretty well-known pseudoscience stuff. Try to give people some weapons of science to, to take with them and to, to debunk some of these arguments. And some of these are obvious, some are more difficult, uh, I provided scientific counter arguments for common young earth creationist talking points, for example, which was kind of fun. I researched the data supporting carcinogenesis from acute radiation exposures. Uh, I researched uh, EMF sensitivity. Uh, and something interesting fall happened. I got a pretty big following. Um, and then I also continued. I learned the difference between medical cohort studies and case control studies for for assessing the literature. Uh, I, I put out a podcast on glyphosate uh, and the toxicity or lack of toxicity of that and lack of evidence for cancer. And then half my audience disappeared because they had some innate biases. Uh, as soon as you counter a cherished belief like Monsanto is the devil, you tend to alienate a lot of, alienate a lot of folks. I'm not saying Monsanto is squeaky clean, but I'm also not going to just go along with unsupported claims. So during my journey, I've encountered a lot of interesting people. I've discovered that other folks like me who believe we can still achieve a Star Trek future do exist. They call themselves eco-modernists. As a group, they believe that technology can allow humanity to decouple growth from debilitating environmental effects through abundant low carbon energy. We need to build a lot of nuclear power in a short time frame, and it can be done. Solar and wind will help with this transition. We need all of our tools. Uh, if you look at the scale of the problem of decarbonizing modern society, it is daunting. Uh, solar and wind can't be available 24-7 as baseload to get us to net zero, though. We need to maintain our existing nuclear reactors and build lots of new ones. I'm an optimist. I think it's a nonpartisan pro-science message that resonates with a lot of people. It provides hope where many have become maybe nihilistic and disengaged. So in summary, I suggest that if you're interested in communicating science to the public, and I think you should be, find an important issue that you're passionate about and engage respectfully within your community. Join a club, give talks, Give educational talks at your local library even. Write letters to your local newspaper. Become engaged. For me, the climate is a big one. 
we as a society, I think, have been seduced by the allure of abundant fossil fuels. And it, I like to make the analogy, they're like the, the one ring in the Lord of the Rings. The, it's an easy source of power that, that corrupts the more you use it. And fossil fuels must be resisted. We need to reforge our society on the basis of low carbon power sources. So I charge you all to be my fellowship of the ring and to go forth and help me to cast fossil fuels back into the depths of Mount Doom. If you want to chat more, come and find the Rational View discussion group on Facebook and check out my podcast at Rational View on Podbean. Thank you. Thank you, Al. That was excellent. Um, I, I'm going to wait. Listen, listen for questions, but first I have uh, something to say. I think I think uh, you make a good point that as physicists, you know, we're uniquely sort of positioned to be able to look at things and and analyze things. And also as physicists, as a group, we tend to be really um, shy, uh, shy away from from uh, confrontation and shy away from expressing our opinions. And I think uh, we need to take. I, I realize that we're probably all a um, you know uh, an introverted group. But we need to take a take a shot at stepping out of that shell and and moving towards a a role where we are more proactive, especially given 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 the fact that you spend all your time getting this broad education. So just have, wanted to get that out. Uh, so if anybody has a question, I can see my screen here. I can see all of you at the same time. If you can raise your hand or whatever. Yeah, for Menti has a question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for the talk, Alan. Uh, I was, I'm curious, uh, what's your strategy when you're designing your podcast to kind of find the common ground? Uh, I haven't personally listened, but I will um, after this. It's, it's a challenge. Uh, and I've gone about it several different ways. Um, what I, what I tend to do is, is take it from first principles, especially in the areas where I don't know a lot. I like to, I, I've, I've found that, you know, starting out knowing nothing about a topic and then talking to the audience uh, and, you know, saying, here is how, here's my hypothesis. I'm going to go research it now and bringing back what I learn and then interviewing people. I'd like to try to interview people um, that are outside my comfort zone. And that's been a challenge. Uh, I, you know, talking to anti-nuclear uh, leaders, for example, is was very difficult to, to, you know, hold my tongue basically and, and find common ground because in often cases they just spew so much stuff that you just want to unpack it all. Um, but that, it is a challenge, uh, and I think that's the, the the most difficult thing is is to be understanding and, and listen to other people. Um, I did a podcast series on gun control, for example, uh, and uh, I learned a lot about the statistics and people on both sides. Uh, and I interviewed and talked to a lot of people. Um, artificial intelligence is another one that was the ethics of artificial intelligence was was a lot of fun. And, and that when I talk to people, you know, that are working on the ethics. Um, so, what I, you know, I try to present the, um, the information as, as unbiased as possible. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have a question, comment, uh, Al. Sure. That, that's a uh, yeah, really interesting stuff. I'm definitely I wasn't aware of that podcast, and, and I'm also surprised we haven't met yet since we <laughs> work in very similar uh, fields. I'm sure it's uh, just a matter of time. But um, yes, yes. Uh, um, the uh, in terms of um, of a suggestion for for a podcast, I don't know if you if you looked at this or not, but I've always been curious about the you know because everything is be is becoming more uh, electrical, uh, electric cars, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. What is the real and life cycle impact of all this lithium mining and, and extraction and, and all of that? I always find that seems to be overlooked when you, if you look at from a car, you know, when you produce a car from the, from its birth to the end, 
if, if you're just looking at the fossil fuel part, but you're missing all the, all the, the rest of it, all the, the, everything, all the energy that goes into like producing the, the, the material for it and the, especially the batteries, the lithium and all that. So, yeah. That, that's definitely an environmental catastrophe that's, that's accelerating with the upswing of electrification of vehicles and Tesla's battery walls and all of this stuff. Uh, you know, there's been unrest in, in Bolivia. There were, there was a coup attempt to, you know, get access to the lithium. Uh, and Elon Musk was tweeting about that. Um, it's not a good situation. Uh, and yeah, I haven't done a, a podcast directly on that, but it's definitely an undercurrent in a lot of them. And in fact, my, my, podcast coming up this this saturday is going to be talking about alternative an alternative approach to to batteries it's uh using um uh advanced nuclear uh to uh to basically manufacture hydrogen and synthetic fuels cool. and i think that's that's got a lot of uh, allure as an alternative approach yeah very interesting yeah Josh Hange has a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Cool. Um, I, so you, you mentioned in your talk how scientists, when they're communicating with the public, they tend to sort of throw out all the caveats and point out maybe where their arguments aren't quite so strong. So I'm wondering, how do you sort of handle that when you're trying to communicate things that are outside your area of expertise? I feel like it's hard enough to know what you don't know within your own field. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a difficult line to walk, and I recognize that that's a very good, uh, very good point. Um, you don't want to uh, come across as as overly confident and then get shot down by making a Dunning Kruger type of mistake. Um, that hurts more than it helps. Um, so. I think it, it's it's mainly down to personal style and and how you tend to come across. Um, I, you know, I typically don't put forward all of the counter arguments in a lot of cases, but I'm maybe not as strong on any conclusions that I might state. And, and typically when I'm communicating to the public that in, in something that I want to change minds or convince people, that's the, the, the row I'm going to take and I'll let them come up with the counter arguments. Uh, Victoria. Hello. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Um, something that I've noticed is when people take on this like strong and angry stance, I find that they're often coming from a place of fear. Um, how do you go about bringing people's walls down and alleviating some of this fear so that they're in a place where they can listen more effectively? That, that's a good point. Uh, fear is a driving factor for, for polarization and it leads to characterization. And I, I think the way to approach that is to humanize both sides and to say, hey, you know, I also want a, a clean environment for my children. And I'm pretty sure that's what you're looking for here too. Have you, um, you know, and asking them, you know, if they, if they put something forward that's, that's, obviously wrong. So why do you think that way? You know, tell me, tell me why you think that, where did you come and help them to investigate the roots of their thinking from a non-confrontational standpoint? Don't, don't come and say, this is wrong because, but say, you know, why do you think that way? Where, oh, that, that came from a, a group that's getting a lot of money from big oil. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and where did they get that from? And, you know, get them to trace their arguments back to, to, to science. Thank you. Uh, um, Chelsea. Thanks for the talk, Alan. Um, my question is a follow up on what Leah asked and it's um, how do you straddle the line with your podcast between unbiased reporting, uh, but also avoiding validating pseudoscience, anti-science and disinformation? So I'm not totally unbiased and nobody is. And I am obviously um, uh, going towards a particular viewpoint, uh, which is a pro-science, um, eco-modernist type of 
uh, standpoint. And I don't, I don't make any, any claims that I am not uh, pushing an idea. Um, but I do try to be open to alternatives and provide an unbiased research of, of both sides of an argument. Uh, and yeah, people can uh, accuse me of bias and, and we could get into that discussion and hopefully they do uh, if, I'm, if I'm on the wrong foot. I, I'm constantly questioning my assumptions as everyone should be. Uh, and it's, in, it's not an easy thing. Thanks. Okay, I see no other hands up. Um, if there are no other questions, thank you, Al.